Stay tuned now for Westchester Eye on the Radio with Peter Moses, John Sharan, and Ardina Seward on 1460 WVOX. Welcome everybody to Westchester Eye on the Radio. My name is Peter Moses. I'm here with my co-host Ardina Seward. Uh, the third person in the box here is away for the week. He's in Phoenix uh, playing with racing cars on, on some level, I guess. Uh, He's a racing car guy, Mr. Charan. John, the man, Charan, Mr. Uh, he ain't my man. You've got mail. Yes. <laughs> that's, that's John's voice. Well, John, if, if you're listening, we miss you, and we look forward to seeing no, you, you on miss the show. I don't miss him at all. Ah, he's John. John's a good guy. He's all right. Mm. He's all right. Well, we have a guest today, Ardina. We have a guest. We certainly do. We have Megan Meehan. I love the name, Megan Meehan, and it kind of fits with Megan's artistic personality. And Megan, thinks, her name reflects her personality. Yeah, Megan Meehan has a certain rhythm to it, has a certain rhyme to it, which is which is nice. It's it's lyrical, or it has good lyrics, shall I say it? Um, and sounds I, like a five points name from this 1830s <laughs> in Lower Manhattan. Hi, Megan. Uh, is it Megan or Megan? It's Megan. It is Megan. Well, that's it's good to Megan. know because <laughs> last week we had a mispronunciation and. Um, Ardina gave me, or, or, or somebody gave me the wrong pronunciation of a guest name, and I've known women with the spelling of your first name who pronounce it Megan, so I wanted to be sure that I wasn't treading on the bad water there. No. Wel- welcome to the show. Um, from what I, You have a project, and uh, Megan is an artist. Are you a fine artist, or what, what is your art? Uh, I am a fine artist, yes. I'm a sculptor. I'm a painter. I work a lot with mixed media, and my I, I am an abstract artist. I love abstract forms and colors, and all of my art is about reflecting joy and happiness. And thank you, by the way, for having me on the show uh, to discuss this. It's really a thrill. Well, you're, you're very, very welcome. Um, in the era that we live in, uh, uh, doing art about happiness uh, almost sounds like whistling in the dark. I mean, we're in, we're in really dark times right now in, in the history of this country. So how do you move forward Uh, with a positive message in such negative times? Um, I don't pay attention to politics, really. I mean, my work has always been happy and joyful. And I basically, I'm very inspired by artists like Moreau and Calder. And all of my work kind of builds on theirs. So, for example, I love their styles. So with my work, I like to make it three-dimensional. And I also like incorporating found objects into my work. And that's because I think that it's wonderful to show people that something that one person might perceive as trash can actually be recycled into art and be turned into like treasure basically like one man's trash is another man's pr- treasure can you give us an example yeah. of that um sure like for example in my work i use a lot of bottle caps um you know like water bottle caps i actually take like water bottle caps and i paint them and then i incorporate them into the artwork and i might put little rhinestones in the bottle cap and then situate it very exactly you know um, on top of paint and then when you see it from a distance, it just looks like this little circular element, and you don't realize that it's a bottle cap until you get closer. Um, I use toys in my work a lot. Um, I actually just made an entire toy reef for the Arsenal Gallery Reef Interpretation Show in Central Park, and that's going to be on exhibit from, like li- I think, uh, November 30th all the way to like January, early January. So, and in that, in that one, I used a lot of like different toy pieces from the 99-cent store, <laughs> So, I mean, I love using things that are everyday objects and incorporating them into art and turning them into fine art. And I even do the same thing with, like, beads and jewelry that people, like, figure, oh, it's broken, I'm going to throw it out. Where, where, where is your studio located? Uh, I live in, I live in uh, Queens. I live in northern Queens. I'm right on the border of Long Island, and I work from home. Interesting. Um, and... Uh why don't you tell us briefly, because we only have two minutes before the break, and then we have a long break. <laughs> so um, we're going to have longer segments. This is not one of them. Um, what inspires you? I am inspired by uh, playfulness. I am inspired by childhood. 
I'm inspired by bright things. I'm inspired by colors. I'm also inspired by um, a lot of folk art. I love folk art, and I love uh, traditional art. Like, for example, I love, if you look at, like, Central American artwork, like the colors, I absolutely love that work. I love um, work from Africa. I'm inspired by different cultures, different artistic expressions, uh, history, you know, pretty much anything that if it's bright and shiny and makes you stop, stare, and smile, I like it. <laughs> so that really is what inspires me. Um, I also work a lot. I, I work as a journalist, and I deal a lot with the toy industry. And I find that that's a major source of inspiration because, like, toys and games just make me so happy. So sometimes I incorporate toys into my work, but I also get inspired just by being exposed to that industry because it's a lovely industry. Do you, do you have Do you have children of your own who have no, toys? No, I don't. Or? I don't have you any don't. children. <laughs> Okay, so are, are, are you in, do you have access to children? I mean, it, it sounds like that, you know, uh, you're, you're very inspired by things that have to do with childhood. Well, I do. I actually uh, work as a project art teacher uh, at the Forest Hills Library in Queens. And three days a week, I teach art classes to children. So um, I teach ages 4 to 6 on Tuesdays. I teach ages uh, 10 to 13 on Fridays. And then on Monday, I have seven to nine. Okay, I'm going to have to cut you off now because we only have a few seconds. But when we come back, let's talk more about what inspires you and, and, and how uh, people can get a hold of your artwork. Uh, this is Westchester Eye on the Radio on WVOX 1460 AM and WVOX.com. And we'll be right back. Uh, I'm not sure how much time we have left, but I, I think uh, we're going to be right back after an eight minute break for a Fox News break. So please stay tuned. Duran and Ardina Seward on 1460 WVOX. Welcome back, everybody. It is Veterans Day. You're listening to Westchester Eye on the radio. I am Ardina Seward, along with Peter Moses and John Turan, who is out today doing what John does best. He is Making out there. noise. <laughs> Peter says making noise. Now John is, is, is a car is a car guy. So he's got a project involved with cars. But before I, I get back to our guest Megan Mia and I want to uh, give a shout out to the veterans who served our country. Two of my friends in particular, John Haygood, a a an Air Force veteran, and Lou Torellis, who I work with and served his country well, went in at the age of nineteen. So Thank you, guys. Thank you for your service. Now, Megan, uh, we have a, we have, <laughs> you have a project, uh, which is a 15-minute play called, i got to look at my notes, Statues, Gold, Silver, and Bronze. I may have the, the colors reversed. But tell us about that play, which opens November 16th. Uh, yes, this, this is a short one-act play. The official titles, title is the, the Value of Gold, Silver, and Bronze, but I just call it statues, like kind of as a slang term, because the official title is kind of long. But um, it's, yes, it's a one-act play. It's uh, about maybe 12 minutes long, 12, 13 minutes long, and it's an outrageous comedy about these three statues. One is gold, one is silver, one is bronze, and they're all arguing with each other about which one is the best. And then when a thief breaks into the mansion that they inhabit, and he only and he's carrying a sack, and the sack is only big enough to carry off one statue, each statue has to figure out a, re a way to convince him to take one of the other two and not them. So it's just this funny, ridiculous farce, um, but I'm very excited to see it on stage. I found some really fantastic actresses. And, um, and we also have a couple of other parts. We have um, an actor that plays the thief that is brilliant, and the guy that plays the rich man is hilarious, and then we have a very talented young woman playing a police officer in it. And this play is being put on at Theater 294 in Farmingdale, Long Island. Uh, this is actually a very interesting uh, theater, because for many years it was called the Arena Players Theater, and it was very well known in Long Island. And then a couple of years ago, uh, the owners of the Arena Player Theater retired, and then um, the current owner, who was also the actor who plays the thief in my play, um, he bought it and turned it into Theater 294. He changed the name. And this one-act play festival, which is going on from November 16th to November 18th, is the very first one-act play festival that is being produced under the Theater 294 name. 
Um, we are really hoping to make this uh, happen twice a year. We're hoping to have the one-act play festival like in the fall and maybe another one in the spring, and we hope to make that kind of a recurring thing uh, to attract a lot of theater goers to Long Island. Uh, the other thing about Theater 294 that makes it really special is that they are very open to producing new original work from local playwrights. So whereas a lot of theaters in Long Island, and I think really every place, uh, kind of deal more with revivals and well-known shows, uh, Theater 294 is really a haven for people who have created original work and want to get the original work staged. And there's a lot of talent on Long Island, and I hope that people you know, realize, realize that, and this theater is a nice little outlet. Well, that's, that sounds great. I know we have, we have many theaters in Westchester County. Um, uh, I mean, it's far from Suffolk County, like Farmingdale's in, but um, mm-hmm. live theater is, is, an, is a singular experience that is always very personal for the audience, at least it should be, and going to see new plays... I was going to make a joke and ask how long is the intermission in your in your play, but that, that didn't make any sense, so I decided not to make the joke. Yeah. Well, this is this one act play festival actually features uh, six plays in total, and there is an intermission. So there's Act One is the first three plays, and then there's an intermission, and then Act Two is the uh, other three plays. So my play, I'm the fifth play, so I'm the second to last one. So I'm in the middle of Act Two. Um, which is exactly how I wanted it because my actresses have to get dolled up in a lot of makeup <laughs> to take on the statues. So we're going to get there early, and I mean, we'll probably be doing the makeup up until the point that they have to go on stage. <laughs> so being fifth really suited me. Um, but yeah, I mean, it looks like a lot of fun. I can't wait to meet the other playwrights. I can't wait to see the other plays. Um, I really, I'm looking forward to it. I feel very blessed to have had this opportunity. Um, I've had a play produced before in Manhattan. I had another work of mine called The Muse, and that was produced at the Manhattan Repertory Theater in March of 2016. And that was that was a wonderful, wonderful experience. Um, it was so great to see my work being performed by actor by an actor and an actress. It was just it's unreal to see your words come to life. And I'm so amazed by the talent of actors and actresses because I don't know like how they do it. I write these plays and I cannot remember the lines for anything <laughs> once I write them. So it's just amazing the the talent and the life that they bring to the characters, and it's it's really wonderful. But this is the first time that uh, the statues play is being performed, so I'm looking forward to seeing it. But but I think that a lot of the 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 val- sometimes the value of the actor is dependent upon the the skill of the director mm-hmm. and how how difficult is it to convey your vision to the actor um well for these i've been very lucky so far um with the short one act play festivals like oh the short one act plays rather i work in a lot of the direction to the in the script so in the script i'll say you know he turned this way she turned that way they look at each other so it's kind of written right into the script. So I guess that that helps the actors and the actresses translate it. Um, on top of it, you know, with, when you have these short one-act plays, um, it's not that difficult to direct it because it, it's very fluid. I suppose if it was a bigger piece, like right now I'm working on a feature length, and that one's obviously going to be way more complicated. And I think when you have like a big cast and big ensemble, then it would definitely be a chore to direct. Um, you know, I have really... You know, the the last the one the one act plays like I can't really say that I directed them. I mean, I, I mean I guess I technically have like I'm down I'm put down as a director of the um, the statues play, but I kind of feel like all the the prompts are kind of in the script already, so the actresses just kind of go with it. So I've been very fortunate and I have not had any trouble with the direction of it. Um, but what's really interesting is watching when the actors and the actresses take on the roles. They will actually do some improv, you know, when they when they get into the rehearsals and you're going over it, you know, time and time again. Because if we have like two, three hours to do a rehearsal, because the play is so tiny, we can go over it, you know, many, many times within that time period. And as they get more comfortable in the role, they'll start adding little bits and pieces, little improv. And I think that that is brilliant because some of the improv that they come up with is so great that not only do I tell them to go with it for the play, but actually I will go back to my script and I will write that improv into the script just to be able to, you know, make sure that in future performances it's used because it's so brilliant. You know, it's a very collaborative medium. And we're going to talk about that more. Of course, we're coming up to a break. We're going to talk about that more on the other side of the break. 
and all the other projects that you are involved in. And how to reach her. And how, and <laughs> how to know how to reach her, Megan. And how, and how, how to read through. <coughs> so it, also the, the phone in for the audience is 914-636-0110 if you have a question for Megan. And you are listening to Westchester Eye on the radio on WVOX 1460 AM. Also stream live worldwide at WVOX.com. Come to us. Come back. We'll see you in a few. Let's return now to Westchester Eye on the Radio with Peter Moses, John Sharan, and Ardina Seward on 1460 WVOX. And we are back live from the studios in New Rochelle of WVOX. You're listening to Westchester Eye on the Radio. It, I am Ardina Seward along with Peter Moses. John Sharan is on the road today it is monday it is veterans day and it is also the day that we have megan Meehan as our guest megan is an artist and she is a lot of and a might, playwright and a she's playwright a, she's a multi an artist, talented artist an online professor a a a a multi a peter said as peter said a multimedia artist she, and she's also written novels and children's ebooks <laughs> and she's going for her phd What's your PhD going to be in, Megan? Um, my PhD is I'm doing it through the uh, university at Buffalo SUNY, and it's educational psychology. But the official title of the degree is Curriculum Instruction and the Science of Learning. Um, ultimately, I want to use it to design courses, specifically online courses. I'm a big believer in online education. I go, um, I, I actually do the PhD online, and I love the school. I would recommend University at Buffalo. Um, at SUNY to anybody. It is a wonderful school, wonderful professors. They are fantastic. I can't say enough good things about them. Um, but my areas of interest are entertainment education and gamification, um, <laughs> which of course ties into the toy industries that I work with a lot. It ties into the books that I write, especially books for children, and it even ties into the playfulness of my art. So everything kind of you know comes together. <laughs> it's the same genre, sort of. I, I, I'm curious, Megan, since you are getting a Ph.D. in a science, psychology, mm -hmm. there's a lot of um, theory and studies floating around about the difference between the artist's brain and creativity and where that comes from as opposed to the hardcore science brain. Have you done any, have you been involved in any studies in that? I have personally not been involved in any studies of that. Uh, what's interesting about this particular degree is even though it's called Curriculum Instruction and the Science of Learning, it is a very um, a humanities based degree. Uh, like, for example, my bachelor's degree is in English literature, my master's degree is in communication, and those are both um, arts degrees, so it's like bachelor's of arts, master's of arts. And the PhD, they were very open to having art students um, into the program because this is a very customizable program. So basically, we only have one course that every doctoral student must must pass, and then other than that, you have complete free range, you and your advisor, to select the courses that you want to take to kind of choose your own adventure as you work towards your dissertation. So they understand that if some people are way more like arts based, um, you know, like kind of have a more artsy mind, like my, like mine, like I'm I'm desperate at math. I would be so horrible at anything to do with math. Um, you know, we're kind of allowed to center our studies on what we want to go into because obviously when you get to a PhD level, the, the work is very uh, it's very specific type of study. You know, like we have to really choose your path and really follow along that that path leading up to your dissertation. Which, 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 which uh, it, getting back to, 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 the, to, to, the, to the question, what does a parent do with a child who, is, who has an artistic mind and the kid's got to learn math? I mean, how do you make that into a, a pleasurable experience as opposed to torture for, for the child? Mm -hmm. Uh, that's a very good question. Uh, I find that gamification elements, like, again, I've not been involved in any studies about this per se. However, I have read studies um, and, and looked into studies that have shown that when you turn learning into a game, like there's a lot of um, apps out there now, for example, that will basically, you know, fuse games with, with learning. Um, when it is presented in more like a gamified way, uh, kids can learn better that way than they could from a regular textbook. However, it's still a challenge. I mean, not everybody's going to be good at everything. I mean, some kids are really great at math and horrible at writing paragraphs. 
Um, other kids are fantastic writers and can't do math. Um, th- there's a lot of controversy in education in general because it seems like sometimes they want everybody to be good at everything, and that's just not the way that it, it works. <laughs> so uh, for that reason, I'm also a big believer in um, customized education. Like, uh, for example, I was homeschooled, and that was that really allowed me to, from the time that I was really young, to be able to like customize what I was interested in and um, really follow what I'm interested in. And basically that's why when I got into college and I, I did really well, I got um, summa cum laude on my bachelor's degree, and then I graduated my master's degree from Marist College with a 3.9 GPA. And I was able to do that because I was in areas that were of interest to, to me, and I could attribute that to the fact that I was homeschooled and the fact that my education was so customized. Because um, there's no way, I mean, I never would have been able to pass major math courses. It's just never, 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 never. <laughs> But but I mean we, we we have a dilemma in the in the public school system, uh, particularly in crowded urban areas, where teachers just don't have the time to individualize instructions. So it's particularly in in math. So uh, what would be your suggestion? Um, I, I really can't really speak too much in public schools because, like as I said, I was homeschooled. I'm into online learning. I so this is really outside of my area of expertise completely. But at the same point, I would say that pretty much using games to teach can really help any kids, um, especially now because everybody, you know, even in very disadvantaged areas, pretty much everybody has access to phones. And there's a lot of free apps out there that can help with, um, you know, you can download games and learning. And, I mean, that is something that you could definitely try because if the kid takes to it, they could very well learn from games um, and, and do well. Uh, again, though, I really can't speak on public education. It's just not something that I have any experience in. Well, one thing you do have experiences in is is art. And I, I'd like to talk about the business of art mm-hmm. uh, because there's um, it, it's complicated. And what I'm learning recently is that a lot of people buy art not necessarily because they like the art, but they buy it as an investment, which is puts art in a whole different, a whole different arena, uh, where it's all ab- more about money than it is about appreciating the project. Mm-hmm. So I'm just curious if you have experienced that, and what your what, as as an artist who's out and about, what is your opinion about that? Um, this is a great question. It's a great topic. Uh, absolutely, I have seen this. Um, I, I take part in a lot of the art fairs. Like, for example, I go to Art Expo every year, and I show with Art Blend Gallery, who I write for, and they are, they're a fantastic gallery. Uh, they're based out of Fort Lauderdale. Well, when I go to the art shows, you know, there's, there's such a great mix of work there, and it's a wonderful show to walk around. I would say if anybody can go to Art Expo, definitely do it because it's worth it. And you do see, though, that a lot of the artists that sell – are artists that have really have have established names. Now, of course, it's hard to establish yourself as an artist. You know, it's a very crowded industry. But there are some artists that have become you know household names, and those are the people that tend to sell. Those are the works that tend to sell. And ironically, a lot of the artists that do sell are again artists that have already passed away, and like now their work is considered you know very highly valued. Um, like, for example, like Moreau will always sell, Picasso will always sell. But even in the art world now, like, um, it's really people that are able to get their names out there. Now, some of them are able to get their names out there just because they do legitimately create really beautiful work. Um, there's an artist called uh, Socrates Marti- uh, Martinez, and he has done very well at Art Expo. And he creates very beautiful, intricate work. And over the last couple of years, his work has become very highly desirable and sought after. And I think that's just because of the quality of it and the fact that it can fit into a lot of different uh, environments. Like a lot of people that go to these shows buy art for um, real estate. Uh, They buy art for office buildings. Uh, Some people are professional designers that buy art for, um, you know, interior interior designers, excuse me, that buy art for houses that they might be furnishing. And it seems that a lot of art that can fit into a lot of different environments is really what sells the most. Um, another interesting point, especially in places like New York, uh, we've noticed recently that a lot of the works that are selling are works that tend to be a little bit smaller because a lot of people that live in New York, they live in apartments right. and they don't have room for, you know, these massive, huge canvases. So if you go ahead and you create art on, you know, a little canvas, like, you know, 
for, uh, 8 by 10 inches, let's say. That actually has a better chance of selling, not all the time, but most of the time, than a really massive piece. Um, so in, in all that also, a lot of it, like I, I've sold some pieces, and everybody that has bought my work has told me that they bought it because they saw something in it, and it just made them happy, and they wanted to have it. So even though I'm not really famous, you know, it makes me feel good to well, hear that. hold your point, because we are coming up against another break. Got to sell airtime. You're listening to Westchester Eye on the radio, 1460 AM, WVOX.com. And we will be right back. Also, again, the phone number is 914-636-0110. Our guest is artist Megan Meehan, who's going to talk more about the business of art and the art and the business. So stay with us, folks. We will be back. We promise. Let's return now to Westchester Eye on the Radio with Peter Moses, John Sharan, and Ardina Seward on 1460 WVOX. Welcome back. This is the last quarter hour of Westchester Eye on the Radio. I'm Peter Moses with my co-host Ardina Seward. Ardina and I, by the way, have been friends for 34 years. My God. It's a very, very long time. Time flies like when you're having fun, right? Yeah, particularly when one of us is a, has a difficult personality, and it's not Ardina. Um, <laughs> we have our guest today. Uh, um, <laughs> no, I, I, like I'm, I'm having. A, I'm drawing a blank. Megan, uh, me, Megan, me. I know, me, I know. Uh, Megan. Um, before we go any further, Megan, how do people contact you if you want them to be able to contact you? How would they do it? Um, I don't actually have a website yet. Believe it or not, I'm working on that. I need one. Um, but if they want to contact me. The best thing to do is to look for me on LinkedIn. I have a really um, developed LinkedIn, pro LinkedIn profile, and that will give you like full information about me. Um, so to search me, you can Google me or LinkedIn search me. Um, it's Megan J. Meehan. That's M-E-A-G-A-N, middle initial J, and then last name is Meehan, M E E. H A N and Facebook too. Can they can they friend yes. you on Facebook? I'm on Facebook and I'm on Twitter as well. And um, I I really only use Facebook and Twitter to show my to share my articles that I write. But um, yeah, you can definitely reach out to me there too. Now the art that you do the the um, the sculpture and the other the other art. Um, do people buy them? Or are you just? Uh, I mean, you make you make your living doing art. Um, I'm. I'm semi-professional. I certainly don't make a living doing it, but I have sur I sold a number of pieces. Um, I just sold four pieces at the Master Pequa Library, believe it or not, at wow. the end of October. Um, yeah, I was really, I've been really fortunate because some artists go through their whole lives never selling work, and I've sold, I've sold about a dozen pieces at this point, which is pretty good, um, considering that I've really only been showing for like six or seven years. So that, that's, that's, I'm, I'm happy with that. I'm satisfied with it. Um, but yeah, I mean, um, my work is, is pretty much just, as I said, intended to bring joy to people, and I guess it's brought joy to a number of people that have ended up purchasing some pieces. Is that the future of galleries, Megan? Because I see a, I see a, a phenomenon. I mean, you go to these Manhattan galleries, and you see art with price tags of eight, nine, ten thousand, twenty thousand dollars $10,000, and then you go to the smaller galleries, the boutique galleries, uh, that some of which are not even in Manhattan, where people can pick up art, like for, in Westchester, like in Westchester for a couple hundred bucks, and those are selling fast. Mm -hmm. Well, definitely. I um, well remember all w with art. There's it's a really strange industry in that there's no like rigorous set of rules about exactly how to get into the art industry. But the majority of artists, at least in my experience has been that you start out small. You start out with library shows. Then you get into some smaller galleries. And then from there, you know, you kind of build up a profile. And at that point, you're eligible to enter the larger galleries in the city. Um, so the reason that the price tag is going to be bigger in the city is because if an artist is showing at one of those venues, chances are they've already established themselves to a certain extent. Um, the key, if you're an art buyer and you really want to look at up-and-coming artists, is to go to the smaller boutique kind of galleries and look around and see what they have, because a lot of times that's where the um, the emerging artists are. Got to ask you about vanity galleries, which mm -hmm. is another phenomenon, which is a, a basically a, a, a pay-to-play, and they're popping up all over the place. Mm -hmm. Art used to be a business where 
an agent would find you or you would get an agent and then the gallery would court you and ask you to sign up with them. Now you have these dozens of, hundreds of galleries that have, that have popped up, particularly in New York City, where they will have an exhibit for you, but you have to pay them four, five grand to have your art exhibited and you might not even sell a piece. And there's a big question about the legitimacy of these galleries and whether these galleries are really respected in the art world. Absolutely. Um, well, as far as these galleries go, there's a lot of controversy. Uh, for the most part, uh, galleries that are considered vanity galleries are not given the same level of respect as traditional galleries are um, by people that are in the art industry. Um, it, it's just the way that it is. It's almost like self-publishing versus traditional publishing. Right. A lot of authors that self-publish find that they've essentially um, you know, hindered themselves because a lot of traditional bookstores, even libraries, don't deal with self-published authors. Um, so that's kind of the way it is with the vanity galleries as well. They are not as well respected. Um, but again, it's very difficult to get into the art world. So some people feel like, oh, you know, I really want my work to be seen and I want to see what happens. So they're willing to take a gamble and pay to get into the galleries just for the experience of having a show. Uh, the same way that a lot of people that write books feel that, oh, the publisher may not pick it up, but I really want to have the experience of having it out there. And they're willing to pay. But they certainly are not given the same level of respect. Um, I've been very, very fortunate in my life that I've never, I've never, um, I've never had to pay to show work, and I've also never self-published a book. So I'm very, even though I don't have an agent yet, I'm looking. But um, I've been very fortunate in that way because I would warn artists and I would warn writers mm. that if you do pay a vanity gallery and if you do self-publish a book, to an extent, it is going to be a bit of a, a mark on you hmm. because I have heard that it, like, I, like I'm having trouble finding an agent right now and I've never self-published I've never uh, shown an abandoned gallery and agents are really hard to find I've also heard rumors and I can't really I can't say for sure whether this is 100% true or not but I have heard that if an agent looks at your profile and sees that you have paid a abandoned gallery or sees that you have self-published a book a lot of times that would be enough to make them just pass you over. Wow. Because, and I don't, know why, I don't know why that is, but that is something that I've heard many, many, many times. So I just kind of feel that there must be some sort of truth to it if I've heard it that much. But again, I can't like 100% substantiate that. But it's just not a risk I'm willing to take. Kind of de de delegitimizes them. But speaking about, about who's legitimate and who, who isn't legitimate, there appears to be an underrepresentation of black and Latino artists women also, but particularly black and Latino artists are not featured at the galleries. And it doesn't mean that there isn't a wealth of talent, but there seems to be a kind of silent bias in the art world where their works are not valued. Is that just my, my uh, imagination, or is that something that you've observed also? Um, I can... I mean, I've not had direct experience uh, with this, but and I know like the galleries that I have dealt with have had a really um, nice mix of different uh, cultures and different like people that they represent. But I can definitely see where you're coming from because honestly, like when you go to Art Expo, the vast majority of artists there are from you know Asia or from Europe right. or you know uh, you know North America. But there definitely does seem to be uh, underrepresentation of black and Latino artists. Uh, that being said, at Art Expo last year, I did notice that there were many, many more artists from South America than I've seen in other years. Um, a lot of artists were coming in. Actually, people traveled to the show from, mm. from overseas. So there were a lot more artists from Mexico. There were a lot more artists from Ecuador, a lot more artists from Colombia. Um, at least that's what I noticed because I was walking around, you know, I give out business cards because I like to write about artists as well. Now, maybe they have ha they've had other artists there from all over the world in other years, and I simply noticed the South American artists more because I was attracted to their work because right. the people I spoke to all had bright, colorful work, like abstract work that just attracted me. Um, but I guess that that would be a step in the right direction, you know, the fact that you see more of that. And um, right now at, at MoMA, at the Museum of Modern Art, or maybe, yeah, I think it's on until January, there is a beautiful show on there right now of an artist from Africa, from um, I think he was from the Democratic Republic of the Congo, and he created this beautiful dream city that was um, out of found materials. <laughs> and he, again, this is the whole thing where the artist has now passed away, and after he's passed away, his work becomes really famous. 
But if you're interested in seeing some amazing contemporary art out of Africa, it's contemporary abstract art from Africa, I would definitely suggest going to that show. It is brilliant. Well, thank you, Megan. We are coming into our final stretch, our last uh, few seconds of the show. So I want to say thank you for having you on as a guest. So who do we have next week? Next week, I have reached out to a social media phenomena by the name of Adi. Adina Miles, A-D-I-N-A-M-I-L-E-S. Adina Miles is an orthodox woman in Brooklyn who goes by the handle of Flatbush Girl. She's run for political office. And let me tell you, she's making a lot of waves, not only in the orthodox world, but in general society about her opinions, her attitudes, and her progressiveness. You are certainly more drawn to the Orthodox Jewish world than I am. Because this girl, God willing, she will be on the show next week, and she is a maverick. Well, I look forward to participating in that conversation. Yeah. Yes, indeed. So you heard it here first, folks. Uh, if there's any updates, please go to Facebook and I will post everything on Westchester Eye on the radio. On that note, we're going to say goodbye. Uh, we'll be back next week with the, the guest star Dina just outlined. And you guys have a great week. In honor of.